This is Chris J from the All Y'all Podcast, and we are recording right now in downtown Shreveport's Cohab Studios. Sarah's here with me, and we are joined by a very special guest. Sarah, do you want to introduce yourself and our guest? Sure thing. I'm Sarah Aber. I'm so excited to be visiting with Hicks Brooks today, and we're going to be talking a little bit about the Louisiana Hayride and its legacy and what it means to you. Um, I'm really excited to hear from you as someone who has had so much success in their career and is from Shreveport what the Louisiana Hayride means to you and how it's shaped your career. Well, it's important, Am first, thanks for having me. And um, gosh, I don't even know where to start. I guess uh, probably, you know, from the time I was four or five years old that I can remember, uh, my mom died when I was like four years old and we lived down on, on Shreve Island. Uh, Johnny Horton lived two blocks from us over on wow. Audubon, yeah. And of course, Billie Jean was married to, to Hank before she was married to Johnny. So it was, was his last widow. And she's been, uh, she's been fun to keep up with over the years. We, we had a lot of ties, I found out, when we got to Nashville. But as a kid, you know, I grew up hearing Hank Williams songs, and especially Johnny Horton songs, too, because he was right down the street. I, I remember like it was yesterday my dad stopping in front of their house and was a wreath on the door. I was probably six years old when he was killed in a car wreck. And I asked him what that was. He said, well, Mr. Horton uh, died last night, you know, in in a car wreck. Those memories are all tied me in a real tight way to, to the cornerstone of country music in my mind. And I always thought it was really cool. I always took great pride in Shreveport and and the Louisiana Hayride, the legacy of, it was kind of an outlaw opry, you know? It's like Hank and Cash, even after he kicked out the lights at the, a lot of those guys got thrown off. Elvis, of course, wasn't accepted at all. They just didn't dig him at the Opry a bit, but they loved him in Louisiana, you know? We get it, and it's funny. I've, I've talked with Ronnie Dunn over the years. When we first got together, we didn't know each other from Adam. You know, we met on a Tuesday, we're encouraged by a record company guy who's trying to get a duo put together to write some songs. We wrote our first two number one records as the week we met, wow. you know, and took off on this crazy ride that we had both been around a long time. I was 36 years old. He was 38 years old. We'd been playing clubs, and I'd played all over for years. The chances of that happening, you know, and he had this legacy that he was born in Texas but really came up in the Oklahoma area, you know, with – um, with Clapton and Leon Russell and all those guys when all that was happening. And I was playing the clubs here. You know, it's funny. I just slowed down coming over the Texas Street Bridge, licking down uh, where Humphreys used to be. I don't know how many nights I played in that place. But it was it was rocking back then, you know. And, and we took a lot, of, a lot of pride in where we came from. But for us... It was really all the all the cool stuff that I was chasing was coming up out of Austin or California. You know, I worked for my dad, had a pipeline construction company here and a pipeline testing company here in, in Shreveport. And uh, and all us truck drivers, you know, had those pointed toed cowboys boots and had that hair slicked back, those big <laughs> pompadours, and I just thought they were cool as any. They, they, they were loved cool. <laughs> Haggard and Jones. That's they didn't want to hear any of that other crap. It's like that was it for them, especially Haggard. He was the guy for truck drivers, you know, and tough guys. But they loved Jones too. And to me, you know, hearing the Eagles and the stuff I was chasing and trying to do my guitar with the Almond Brothers, you know, we were. We were really chasing that that thing. And even in Austin, some of my first shows here, there was a place called the River City Music Hall that was, God, I bet it was probably legit 1,500 to 2,000 people warehouse that they converted into a really cool, and everybody played there, and I opened for all of them because I could make a lot of noise just banging on a guitar all by myself. I was cheap. I was 25 bucks, and, and I was hired. <laughs> wow. Yeah, yeah, but everybody that came through, and I got to be friends with Jerry Jeff and, and even Dirk Kershaw, Sleep at the Wheel, Nitty Gritty Dirt Band. You know, years mm-hmm. later, I reminded Jeff Hanna of that and wound up having a number one record that I wrote for those guys, you know. So a lot of those ties back there. It's a long answer to a short question you asked, but it always kind of came back to when people talk about the Opry, I'd talk about the Hayride. 
you know, because our tradition to me was just a little tougher and was a little cooler and was a little swampier. And, you know, we just, we, we were a little outlawish compared to what they were doing. It was just their thing. It was very based on bluegrass and out of the hills and all that. And our stuff was just, it was country, but it rocked a little harder, you know. And I always, I always thought that was cool, and I've always taken great pride in that. There's almost, I know this is a weird word to describe the Louisiana Hayride, but through today's conversations, there's a punk rock vibe. <laughs> yeah. That's like, yeah. oh, the, the bass player for so and so is too hungover to play. Well, who do we got? You know, and <laughs> they're just cobbled together some impromptu uh, three piece to uh, fill in for Johnny Cash, who's still 45 minutes away because he was bass fishing until time for the show. <laughs> it's been really great. Do you think that, so Northwest Louisiana is a really, interesting place because people think of Louisiana they think of New Orleans and they think of Northwest Louisiana they think oh that's just East Texas you know or they make some Texas comment and I'm sort of like I don't think that's a negative I think it's a positive because you get the red dirt country you get the roadhouse blues and you still get some Louisiana sound too here I mean you still get some quote unquote New Orleans vibe here yeah but you also get those outlaw country guys the cowboys the East Texas guys you know um do you feel like Shreveport, quote unquote, like has a sound or that it influenced your sound at all, given all those different influences that were swirling? Well, in? we're obviously night and day. You know, I'd always wonder when I got out of tech, and of course I played around here, Jerry Jeff was one of the first people that I really opened up for more than once and played with when I was at tech and, and whatever. And those guys were crazy. I mean, they were a whole different level of crazy. They all were. And it's, I was just, you know, uh, down there with Ray Wiley Hubbard, gosh, it's just a few months ago. Still just crazy. I mean, there, there's a handful of guys. They hadn't changed a bit. And I actually wrote a song about Jerry Jeff on one of our Brooks and Dunn records and called him up and asked him if, you know, he'd play on it with me. Of course, I, I sent it to him, and it's kind of, you know, it's kind of a mid-tempo sort of song, but it's about him. The, the song, I'll give you just a little background, because we're at Tech, and I'd never met him before. So I'm, I was kind of scared of him, because I was a huge fan, and, and he was already notorious for, you know, just ripping this swath of craziness and, and hell-raising, you know, everywhere he went. And he, I'm standing there on, next to the steps on the side of the stage, you know, and and he comes walking up the steps. Well, you know those those plastic things that you put a six pack of beer in. Mm -hmm. He'd run his belt through that, and he had a six pack hanging off of each hip. And he he's about to walk up the steps, and he takes a drag and throws this thing on the ground. He walks up on the stage, he pulls one of those beers off, he chugs the whole thing, and throws it down on the stage. And he goes one, two, three, kicks off his first song. So. That's the first line of the song is Jerry Jeff Walker stumbled to the stage with a Martin guitar and a dun dun dun, dun and a six pack. And and uh, anyway, so I sent him the song and said, Hey Jerry, would you mind, you know, singing on this thing with me? He goes, well, Let me listen to it. <laughs> so he calls me back about five minutes later, he goes, Well, yeah, I'll do it, but you know, it's called the ballad of Jerry Jeff Walker and you know, it's a, it's kinda it's not really a ballad, it's kind of a up tempo. I go Jerry Jeff, it's like ballad is, that means a story, you know, it's not, it doesn't have to be, the tempo doesn't have to be, which, and anyway, he goes, he goes, you know, and it's, it's really a three, four, you know, it's, it's not, and you're counting it off like a one, two, three, four, but it's, it's are you going to sing on this thing or not? So anyway, but sure enough, when, when I got to, he made me promise to do it in his studio, so when I get to Austin, he shows up at the studio and he's got a Martin guitar and a six pack. So he honored the first line of the song, and we had we had a good time working together and reminiscing. And he came up to Nashville. We've hung out some since then and just talked music about a lot of you know when Guy Clark died. Mm. I got went and spent some time with Guy about a week before he went out, and that was probably the last time I talked to Jerry Jeff. But he he totally credits Guy for his success, which I think he can. You know, there's. To me, it's some of his greatest songs, certainly L.A. Freeway and some of that stuff, Guy wrote. You know. Well, speaking about songwriting, I mean, you're, um, I think of you primarily as that. I hope you don't mind. I think of you as a songwriter. No, that's the greatest compliment you could give me. Well, I mean, uh, and around here, it's almost like there's something in the water. You're talking about, you talk about Lead Belly. Uh, you, uh, you talk about Hank Williams' time here when he really had his career 
just completely had a second wind and he, he made some of his best songs mm-hmm. while he was living here. There's just I do think there's something in the pine trees and the red dirt and the and the catfish or <laughs> the hush whatever, puppies, yeah. whatever we're eating and drinking and, and seeing on a daily basis. It gives birth to some great songs. Yeah, yeah. It again at that time the you know I I was caught up in that the Texas mentality of you don't even want it to be a hit. You know you want to write a great song. You want to write a story, but generally those songs don't have catchy choruses and stuff like that. You know, you just, you want to move people. The last words that Guy Clark told me when I'm sitting there shaking his hand and he just didn't want to let go and we're just staring at each other knowing, you know, it was the end. And he finally just kind of nodded his head and he said, well, go break a heart. You know, but just songwriter cool to the end. And that's that's what I was trying to do just write songs that mattered and I didn't care about a hit and most of the Nashville songs I was hearing really didn't move me you know like some of the Haggard stuff you know and there's an occasional song I'd hear coming out of those truck drivers trucks and I go man that's pretty cool but man those records don't sound very good that <laughs> they don't sound like the Eagles to me or all the brothers of the stuff that was really kicking my butt you know that it doesn't sound like Leon Russell music, you know, or even the the Texas guys. They were rocking that stuff a little bit, and Nashville wasn't. You know, they were putting a lot of strings on stuff at the time and whatever. It just didn't sound cool to me. But uh, I had been to military school in high school, and my roommate uh, invited me. He was running Charlie Daniels Publishing Company, and Charlie was cool. You know, he was on my cool list. Yeah. And uh, so, I, I, he, you know, I, I went to New Orleans. I played, I think my last run was like 72 nights in a row down there. Oh, my God. Yeah, and I was I was burned. I was playing five nights a week at the old Absinthe House. At the end, I was playing from 9 at night till 6 o'clock in the morning. I was 45 on and 15 off, and I was just worn out. Anyway, I called my friend Jody. I said, you really think I could make a living writing songs? Because he'd been trying to get me to come up there. He said, man, get your butt up here. And that's when I, when I, I spent about six months passing all what I thought was my cool stuff around and, you know, getting nowhere, people, you know, saying, nodding their heads. And then the next time I would call, they were always out to lunch or whatever, you know, I learned a valuable lesson. If you ever get a shot, you better make it a good one, you know. It's a, I've always heard it's just an incredibly hard town. It's a, that it that it can have a mental effect on you when the greatest guitar player you've ever met in your life is delivering food for a living, or you yeah. know, I mean, it's just like it can. Well, I thought I was a good guitar player till you know I went to my first demo session to cut one of my songs, and everybody in there could play better than me. I mean, I studied guitar at two different colleges, and these guys are running circles around me. I'm like, okay, you guys play. I'll try and sing because most guys are singing circles around me too. You know, it's the level of talent there is just ridiculous. And I have to watch myself when I'm in trying to encourage young people with their dream because all I can say is you have to understand how freaking good these people are. I mean, everybody up there that's making a living at it is at the top of their game and they are really, really good at it. And that's when I realized as a songwriter, if I was going to make a living at it, I needed to learn what, you know, the craft. And the people I really loved, Roger Miller and Chris Christopherson and Guy Clark and Towns Van Zandt, they were all in Nashville. And they thought writing a hit was cool. You know, and I'm like cool enough for you i mean first when i finally got to meet god i was a nervous wreck because i was such a fan of his but man he i mean he's like we got to write a hit pal i'm like okay i thought we were just going to try and write something cool he goes you know you got to do both but it's got to matter i mean he always said being a star was easy he said if you want to be a star he goes that's easy all you got to do is just do what they tell you to he goes if you want to be an artist you got to think about it you got to do something good, and you really got to pay attention to what you're doing. And it was that's great advice, you know. Beyond that, you just got to dig in, work, and no matter what they tell you, you got to believe in yourself, you know. That's really <laughs> great advice. 
I'm dying to know, uh, when you were living in Shreveport and coming up, did you ever go to any shows at the Municipal? No. No, that's not true. That's absolutely not true. (laughs) I was about to say no because I thought, I think of Hearst as a place we always went for big shows, and I went to a lot of shows there. Oh, yeah. I saw Steely Dan there. I saw Steely Dan. I saw, and uh, gosh, um, uh, Edwin Birdsong, who probably means nothing to you. I think he might have had one record and one almost hit. Um, And I'm trying to think of songs. I saw a handful of shows there but I do remember Steely Dan uh, when they were kind of in, in reeling in the years when they were oh, just wow. first taking off yeah where were, so this is catnip for our Shreveport people yeah. Yeah. where were your spots did you have do you have places that you got to go when you come to town or oh well um, Herbie Case is number one um, uh, you know if if I'm uh, getting a Muffy I go to Fertitta's um, Ernest am I Ernest Sr. and my father were dear friends. There was a Red Snapper Brooks on the menu. Barbara and I had our rehearsal (laughs) dinner at the Ernest downtown here. Um, And I still, I won't leave town without going by and seeing Ernest and uh, at least visiting with him. We love talking about our dads, you know, and they were were such great friends. And still, I put his crab claws up against anything. And I'll put a shrimp buster up against anything. My absolute favorite anything anything i told my wife she goes what are you doing tomorrow i said well we could head over to monroe we're meeting some friends we have a family farm you know south of monroe down there where we're ultimately headed on this trip but i said man i might just i got some friends with some guns let's go to the gun club she likes to shoot too and uh because i gotta stay long enough to get a shrimp buster before i get out of here you know? <laughs> that's awesome yeah david and angela doe are good friends they're oh, gonna cool. be delighted to yeah. hear you no that. they know it <laughs> They're really keeping the legacy alive over there. It's been it's really great. inspiring to see Just them the do other that. day, they posted a photo of Alice Cooper having dinner there the night of his show. Oh, yeah. And it was really funny because you could tell Alice Cooper did not want to be photographed eating that shrimp buster. But he <laughs> kind of got his own. <laughs> I don't know it. why not. What's cooler than a shrimp buster? I don't think he expected to be recognized. Uh, he was kind of incognito. Gotcha. You know, but it's so fun. It's a funny photo. He though. didn't have his makeup on. <laughs> <laughs> Um, before we wrap up, I'd love to just talk a little bit more about the Hayride. Do you find yourself listening to recordings from the Hayride? And, and if you do, are there any particular ones that stand out for you as a songwriter that kind of touch you and inspire you? You know, over the years, um, I have. And, I mean, there's a lot of iconic stuff there. KWKH was um, kind of one of the one of the places where, before I had really had anything going. I'd just gone to Nashville and whatever, but it was a place where I could go bang on the door until they let me in and I'd, you know, make up whatever minor thing that I had done or met in Nashville, you know, and and there were several jocks that would let me hang around the studio. And uh, so there, there was a great legacy there. And I, you know, I can't put my finger on a performance, honestly. It's, but I can remember quite a few my, one of my bass player who Danny Milliner who's actually from Pineville um, we we've played together forever he was actually playing over here in a, in a basement with a just singing with a great horn band and one night I caught him playing bass I went man that guy can really play so when I had my first solo deal on Capitol uh, I rounded him up in Hassel Teekle who's a a uh, local piano player and whatever friend of mine his big brother and I were, had been roommates over at Tech and we we put us a band together and they all moved to Nashville and and we danced on it for a minute nothing big happened but um actually cut a song of mine sacred ground that wound up being a number one record for for McBride and the Rod but we stirred it up a little bit but Danny had been at the Hayride so he had a ton of great stories even then you know it was still going in the mm-hmm. 80s, a lot of people think, you know, it was dead in the 60s, mm-hmm. but, you know, it was kind of revived. There's a lot of people around here. Maggie Warwick obviously mm-hmm. dedicated her life to keeping that legacy alive. We and spent a lot of time talking about her today. Oh, yeah. She's she's easy to talk about. She was so much fun and and, it, and so inspiring. You know, it's, it's easy to, you know, get above your raisin and have some success in Nashville. And it's like, gosh, the hair ride's not doing anything, but... Man, when you see it, you come back home and you see a passion from somebody like her and the people that still care about the legacy, what happened here, it, you know, it just it 
makes me want to come back and sit down with you guys and talk about it. You know, it's it's uh, it's important to, to where we come from. Um, all the great music that came out of here. You know, a lot of people that uh, that inspired me to do what I do, and you just mm, don't be forgetting that stuff. You know, there's there's a lot of heart and soul there that should be a part of of what you're doing. So my only concern is that they're having like a, a business meeting over there that's apparently <coughs> going to get loud. Yeah. But we, I think Chris has a but few more questions. No, just one. Okay. I mean, th- honestly, that's the perfect ending. So yes, we it may is. Just this is there. bonus. But well, <laughs> well, I'm a fan. I mean, I'm. Uh, I grew up in my mom and I grew up in Sarepta. Okay. And my mom and dad would keep us busy by putting us. Trace sit- came from over there. Yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> we would, she would sit us down in the den and put on a record or put on a CD or, well, it wouldn't have been a CD at that time, <laughs> dating myself. But we'd usually either listen to Jerry. This is weird. I'm going to tell you the truth. We'd usually either listen to Jerry Clower's comedy albums oh. or my mom. Oh, would, yeah. <laughs> or my mom would put on Brooks and Dunn. And she was <laughs> obsessed. I think, she, well, she married a guy that looks just like you, so that might tell you oh, something. Oh, Lord. But we'll get her therapy. She'll be all right. <laughs> so uh, the other day, uh, I say the other day, a couple of years ago, I listened to New, New in This Town, New to This Town. Oh, cool. And it knocked my socks off mm-hmm. how good it was. And I hope you don't take that the wrong way. No. It was like. Why the, would I? Well, the title track, <laughs> I should expect you to be good. But the, the title track in particular, I think, is just such an example of the songwriting craft and how, I mean, I think me and my mom both like kind of teared up listening to it. And mm. she was like, it's amazing how good he still is. <laughs> how do you stay? Like, I think sometimes, I know this is probably not the healthy way to think about art. But Sarah and I both write a lot, and I think of it sometimes as a reservoir that is running down on me. You know, like if you just push and you push, then that little reservoir is going down. Mm-hmm. And some folks like you, I meet, and it just doesn't seem like the reservoir is running down. How do you keep it full of cre- – like how mm-hmm. do you stay on top of your game? It does. I don't know. It's uh, And it, it does run down. Everybody, everybody struggles with that. When you write – I've got, I don't know, over a couple of thousand songs recorded at Sony Publishing now that I've actually demoed, you know, and and people go, man, you need to go back through those. I go, no, I don't. All the good ones got cut. And there's 1,800 <laughs> songs that just aren't that good, you know? They're, okay. you know, your friends, your family here, man, I love that thing. It's, you know, mm. that's a hit. No, it's not. You know, if, you know, after you write two or three thousand songs and you've been banging on doors for that long and played them for that many people, sometimes you really get, you know, you don't write that many that your your heart and soul is really into, and you go, this this is a freaking hit. Sometimes I do that, and you know that song I was talking about, the Dirt Band cut. I played that for everybody at the time, Alabama and Randy Travis. They're all like, man, I just don't get this thing. You know, you just played it for the dirt band they're like where's this band i go all over freaking town if y'all cut it you're an idiot because everybody tells me it's not a hit you know and had a big old number one record with it so i really feel like you know to me there's two kinds of songwriting there's perspiration and there's inspiration and you got to do them both and some days you stare at that white piece of paper or that computer screen, and you and you got a guitar in your lap, and you go, ah, I got nothing, I got nothing, and that's when you just do something, you know. My son's a screenwriter out in Los Angeles, and he was struggling with some block the other day. You know, I said, just get to the end, and then come back and pick at it. But I can't tell you how many times. I remember I was writing with a guy, Chris Waters, one day. We were writing a song that was so mediocre. We both know it, but we're just pounding through, doing the craft, you know. Just, we're just going to get to the end. And one of the lines I threw out, and, and you made a rock of a rolling stone, was just a line, and it goes, ooh, ooh, and just like throw that, that other thing away, and here we go, you know, and had a hit on the oaks with it. But that's where perspiration Will pay off for you because some days you think you got nothing and there's and something will pop up you know you can surprise yourself i think it, as a songwriter some days you just got to do the work and some days you just throw it in the trash and you know i can't tell you the lunch is like it for songwriters we all co-write in nashville all the time and man we call it you know mouth breathing but 
some days you're just you're like what about and you, we're all just sitting there going <laughs> just trying to think of something it's like god what time is it? it's only 10 30 we're still a good hour from calling lunch you know because lunch is sometimes stuff will happen you know but man those mornings can be tough when you with three people with nothing because when you're writing songs for a living you've already written all that stuff you had in a pad but you know last night it's funny i was showing barbara on the airplane coming over here today i said Look at this, and it was so weird written. I said, I wrote this in the complete darkness because I didn't want to wake you up. <laughs> but I had three great lines, you know, and, and you know, I, I can still, at least I can still read it. I knew the next, you know, this morning I'd be able to know what it was, and it was still pretty good. That's not always the case, but you always got to try, I think. If I think of something in the middle of the night, I either get up or I'll just write it in the dark. And <laughs> I'm going to put a notepad by the bed when I get home. Oh, you yeah. got to do that. Well, thank you, and yes. congratulations. I mean, you're a source of pride for so many of us locals. Um, oh, thanks. You've got your upcoming induction, I think, into the Country Music Hall of Fame, which is pretty Congratulations. Huge. Thank Amazing. you. Amazing. That's so pretty proud. crazy. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, it's just an honor to be able to share some time with you, and I hope one of these days uh, that we'll have a big, beautiful museum about music in North Louisiana, and we can get you to get in that museum, too. 